Welcome to This Birding Life, a podcast for bird watchers everywhere. I'm your host, Bill Thompson III. This is episode 60, a visit to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. These 60 episodes are made possible by our podcast host since the very start, Birdwatcher's Digest. Birdwatcher's Digest is the magazine for birders who love to read and readers who love to bird. If you're listening to this podcast but not subscribing to Birdwatcher's Digest, you're missing out. Find out all about BWD, our publications, our digital content, our super helpful website, our events for birdwatchers, and more at birdwatchersdigest.com. We have two other sponsors to thank as well. Carl Zeiss Sports Optics has been with us longer than any of our sponsors. And this podcast is just one of the many things that Zeiss does all over the world to support birders, birding, and bird conservation. You really need to try Zeiss Optics to experience the difference in quality for yourself. Join the Zeiss community of birders at facebook.com slash Zeiss Birding. The other sponsor of our podcast is Rock Jumper Birding Tours, which offers more than 350 birding trips annually worldwide to pretty much any destination you could wish to visit. Rock Jumper is inviting listeners of this podcast to come along on the birding trip of a lifetime. It's a cruise to the subantarctic islands of New Zealand for albatrosses, penguins, kiwis, tomtits, and all manner of other birds and wildlife. And as an additional enticement, if you register as a This Birding Life listener, you'll be included in my podcast about the trip. I can't wait to go, and I hope you'll join me. Learn more at rockjumperbirding.com. Now on to our episode. Can you believe this is episode 60? I'm totally dumbfounded. Where'd the time go? If you're a birder, you'd have to be living completely off the grid, totally out of touch with the birding community, not to have heard of the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. The Lab of O, as it's known, is affiliated with Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and yet its main purpose is gathering data and doing research on birds and bird conservation all over the world. The lab is one of the world's most prolific practitioners of and advocates for citizen science, where normal people collect and submit data on the birds they observe. This mass collection of information is then vetted by scientists and experts before being included in the massive database maintained by the Cornell Lab. Through its citizen science programs, such as eBird, Project Feeder Watch, and others, the Cornell Lab has amassed a humongous collection of data, and with the support of large scientific grants, as well as private contributions, it's expanded its staff to more than 200 people, all working in the lab's impressively large modern headquarters on Sapsucker Woods Road in Ithaca, New York. I recently had a chance to visit the lab for the first time since the new multi-million dollar building went up, and since many of the newer technology-centric programs had been developed. The change was both impressive and inspiring. Here are some of the conversations I enjoyed with some of the folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I'm Mary Guthrie. I'm the Director of Corporate Marketing Partnerships for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And we're standing in what we call the Fuertes Room, obviously, because we have the largest collection of Fuertes paintings on public display. And you can come and visit us and see them anytime. We are looking at them, and, and I like to point to them because they relate directly to where the lab started, which was uh, our founder, Doc Allen, living here in Ithaca, New York, and being a colleague and collaborator with Fuertes, the painter. And both of them had a commonality in their approach to engaging people about birds. Fuertes had his paintings reproduced in the baking soda boxes of the day as a way to get people to share that love of birds. And our founder, Doc Allen, was similar in that he invited people through his radio program and his record albums to come and see birds and think about birds because he saw them as the key to preserving biodiversity. If we can bring enough people along to think about birds and to think about protecting birds, there are many more less charismatic things that will be preserved also. And that's a key point for the Lab of Ornithology. That's why we come to work every day and mm -hmm. what we want to do in the world. And when did the lab start? When was it founded? 
We're more than 100 years old. Last year was our 100 year anniversary. And Doc Allen, our founder, was a pioneer in the field of research. He was, his study species when he was a PhD student at Cornell was the red-winged blackbird. And rather than seeing it as an individual, he saw it as a key part of an ecosystem. And that was new thinking in his day. So he was the very first professor of ornithology in the nation. And he was a, a fantastic scientist and leader in his field at the time, but also very interested in the public and bringing them to see birds as something more than just their feathers and colors and songs. All right, and the mission of the lab today has expanded I would imagine far beyond what Doc Allen could have envisioned in his day. Uh, what are some of the programs that are, people would have heard of out there who are listening? Well, one of our hallmarks is eBird, which is a, a service-based project, finding a way to capture information about the world's bird species. So you can report any bird anywhere in the world to eBird. Last, uh, this, earlier this year in our Global Big Day, we had more than half of the world's bird species reported on a single day because we have so many people around the world. We also have projects that relate more to your home and yard. So we have our Project Feeder Watch, which will be celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, starting in November. So we encourage everyone to tell us about their place. And so we can use that data for scientific research. I, interesting, you mentioned Project Feeder Watch. I was not working for Bird Watchers Digest at the time, but my dad uh, worked with the uh, folks that started Feeder Watch. I think we gave the first ads to the project or mentions, editorial mentions, and helped get it off the ground. So we feel kind of a kinship with that, and we're still involved a little bit. Yeah, you support us all the time, so we're very grateful for that. Well, it's, it's interesting to see how, I don't know that Cornell Lab coined the term citizen science, but it seems like you certainly own the de facto trademark on it in a way because you have so many citizen science programs and so many people contributing from all over and then that data also going out there and allowing people for example to find birds and things like that it's kind of fascinating to uh the, the reach of that what are some of the challenges that you find in in getting the the mission of cornell lab out there to the public yeah i think there are a few things that people don't really understand about us um well, there's always the white lab coat conversation. I don't know anybody here who wears a white lab coat. Uh, they're field biologists, right? So they're out there in the world collecting information about birds. I think another big thing is that people think we're a school of ornithologists, and we're really not. We do have group leaders here who are faculty members on campus, and it's very important to us that we're connected to Cornell, and we are supporting students and teaching students through departments that are part of Cornell but we don't actually have alumni of the Lab of Ornithology and we don't offer a degree in ornithology at Cornell. Right. I also think that people don't understand that we earn our money ourselves every year. So Cornell doesn't pay our way. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to us that we have the support from the public. Um, we have our magazine members and then we have people who make gifts to our individual mm -hmm. efforts like uh, our Global Big Day or other fundraising and that's how we get by, and that's super important to our future. Well, Mary, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this, but I really appreciate the brief overview, and I just want to say that standing here in front of all these Fuertes paintings is kind of makes you weak in the knees. They're so majestic and amazing. I, I love hearing the stories about him uh, when he went on a trip to, I believe, North Africa, and he lost all his, his artist kit on the way, and he ended up going into a toy store and some town when he landed oh, on the ship the story. and, really and cool. ended up painting all of his last uh, was it Abyssinian birds that he did it's mm -hmm. kind of his last big thing mm -hmm. with a kid's toy Isn't that crazy? art set we really focus on how important the connection between art and science is mm -hmm. you see if anybody gets a chance to come and visit us you'll see in our visitor area and throughout the the sort of consciousness of the lab, art plays a big role in it. Because if you're a field scientist, you're out there sketching all the time, trying to capture your information. Mm -hmm. And that gives you that appreciation for somebody like Fuertes and their ability. You know, he really wanted people to see birds as these vivid, beautiful, but, but alive things. You know, they aren't right. organized on the canvas for composition. Right. He's trying to show their behavior and their habitat and so much that's, that conveys that excitement about birds. Right. Um, and if people wanted to find out more about the lab, 
you guys probably have a website, don't you? Mm-hmm. We have uh, <laughs> birds.cornell.edu. And I will say that we also just recently started a tour program. So we have Cornell undergraduates. So if you come during the school year, they will take you around behind the scenes at the Lab of Ornithology. So we get about 50,000 people a year who come here to see us and see our visitor center. And we're doing more and more to make that a great experience. Well, thanks, Mary. Great talking to you. And I'm sure we'll talk again as the visit continues. Great. Thanks, Bill. Lab Director John Fitzpatrick has been credited with the vision to boost the lab into the stratosphere of activity and outreach it currently enjoys. He took 30 minutes out of his busy schedule to talk with me about the Lab of O. I'm John Fitzpatrick. I'm Director of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology here in Ithaca, New York. And John, the, the, the Cornell Lab has been around for a long time, 100 years now. I, right. I we just uh, celebrated our centennial. Right. Yeah. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's changed drastically over the years, and especially, I would say, in the last 15 or 20, really, with the advent, I would say, of more technology and so forth. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what's happened in the last couple of decades that's made sure. the Cornell Lab such a, a, a yeah. phenomenal success? It's a great question, and of course, it's, a, it's an ongoing process where uh, the, I, I keep referring to us as a... As a as a grand experiment still underway. Um, <laughs> you know, early returns are good, but it's, it's still, you know, changing all the time. Really, the lab started 100 years ago when Arthur Allen was hired at Cornell in 1915, and, and uh, for his whole career, he was the one-man band and ultimately then joined by Peter Paul Kellogg, and uh, they pioneered sound recording in the field and, and color photography and nature. And, um, and after the Allen era, uh, the lab began to tinker a little bit with the idea of engaging citizens in the process of studying nature, but that really got going in the early 1990s. So uh, I arrived here in 1995 uh, after the lab had first gotten gotten its first big grant for, for doing citizen science. Mm-hmm. And um, the lab is actually responsible for, for coining that phrase out in the public. And what we and that coincided with the advent of the internet, and so really a huge part of what's allowed us to grow in terms of influence and in terms of our own scope is the is the internet because we could begin to do genuine uh, scientific research using the sensors that are the human eyes and right. ears uh, all over the planet. Uh, in scales that one could never have imagined before the internet. And, uh, and so a huge part, not the sole part, but a huge part of our growth has been a consequence of our devising ways in which we can engage hundreds of thousands to millions of people around the world's landscapes in observing nature, putting the observations together, and understanding it. So that's a huge part of that growth. Um, in addition, what we did really with the, from the beginning of the mid 1990s was mm-hmm. add some endowed faculty that could build programs in several of the major areas that birds are really good at. Right. Uh, communication, mm-hmm. um, evolutionary biology, um, animal behavior and migration. Um, and so, really, a huge part of our growth now with 200 people here. Um, that growth has been the emergence of about 10 different program areas, mm-hmm. each of which has a very good specialist at the helm. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of an assemblage of a lot of different smaller labs right. all in one spot. Right. And the commonality here is that we're using birds for what they're really good at. They're fantastic scientific research tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are enormously sensitive environmental indicators, mm-hmm. so the whole conservation uh, utility of birds uh, is important. Uh, they're a heartbeat of the world's annual cycle with the, you know, global migrations. And maybe most importantly of all, they, they call us as human beings in our aesthetic senses into nature. They join us with nature, so mm-hmm. we can use them as teaching tools. Mm-hmm. And we're taking advantage of all four of those things here in this uh, experiment. 
And what are some of the programs that our listeners would have would be familiar with? Obviously, eBird, Project Feeder Watch, or two. Right. I mean, Feeder Watch, which began in the 1980s, was really our first, I, I would say, successful effort at engaging right. the distributed citizens in understanding how birds are distributed, especially during wintertime. Um, and it's still going. It's now 30 years or so, uh, almost. Um, and uh, it taught us a lot about doing citizen science. Mm-hmm. Um, it was... Uh, hamstrung during its early part of its life because of the U.S. Postal Service that was in the in hard, hard copy right. data, so it was hard to make it big. Right. Uh, the internet has really changed that. Uh, so Feeder Watch is a is a staple, maybe our longest running right. uh, citizen science project. eBird began in the late 1990s as an experiment of, with the internet, and um, and it has exploded. Uh, we're now getting 600,000 checklists a month. Right from all over the planet, every country in the world, and essentially every species in the world now being monitored by eBird. A um, couple of other citizen science projects that, uh, that are long running here, Nest Watch, which actually has its origin back in the Cornell Nest record card days, <laughs> another distributed citizen science project. Now it's all done by the, uh, over the internet, and it allows us to do things like measuring nest success and clutch sizes across latitudinal gradients like that. So, um, so and um, a couple of other citizen science type projects uh, that exist here, but in terms of programs at the lab, we also have very important and growing uh, uh, program of multimedia productions, for example, which was a spin-off of when we began to getting a lot of videos right. into the Macaulay Library collection. We began realizing the importance of media in storytelling. And so we actually hired a National Geographic uh, producer to come and be the head of our unit. And they are now making absolutely top class um, media stories from 30 second bits for the, uh, you know, for the web, Mm -hmm. YouTube shots, stories and so on, to hour long specials for PBS. And um, so the the idea of of using birds to tell stories that have conservation relevance, that's a huge part of our thing. And that conservation science is is actually one of the things that really drives all the motivations here. And the lab's been uh, a key uh, player in the state of the birds reports that have been coming out. Correct. And probably it's done more to distribute the... It's rather shocking information in that state of the birds mm-hmm. to, to the general public. And right. What, what do you think? What for folks who might not be familiar with that? Mm-hmm. What, what is what what is that? And what are what is it yeah. telling us? State of the birds is really an important uh, an important uh, tool right now, or, or a you know vehicle for uh, bringing together a, a group of, in, of not-for-profit organizations plus some government agencies to um, understand specific questions about how our bird populations are doing, mm-hmm. and what that tells us about larger questions of the right. landscape. Each State of the Birds report typically focuses on some specific issue. A few years ago, we did uh, public lands. We right. used eBird data, actually, to analyze the responsibilities of different government agencies to protect birds in different habitats. Uh, this past year uh, was a, a milestone year. It was the first State of the Birds report that actually engaged Canada and Mexico, as well as the U.S., so it was a three-country, continent-scale effort to look at how certain groups of birds are doing. Uh, waterfowl are doing great. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> grassland birds are doing terribly. Right. Um, forest birds are somewhere in between. Uh, arid land birds are uh, being threatened. Of course, Hawaiian birds are in serious shape. Um, we hope that by working hard on this project year after year, that will continue to be able to focus land managers and government agencies into the things that they can do that will help uh, stabilize and return habitats to a better, more long-lasting, stable condition Mm -hmm. together with humans. That's our goal. It's a worthy goal. I mean, uh, quite an aspiration, actually. It's Um, also mm -hmm. very exciting to be working. It's 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 a specific opportunity we have every year to work with a lot of other partner organizations. So one of the things that is a very important theme at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, after all, we're a single spot based in Ithaca, New York, um, not exactly a crossroads of of, uh, (laughs) people's uh, travels, but we are committed to serving the world. Right. 
and we can only do that by working with partners. So right. we have a lot of relationships with other not-for-profits in right. conservation and, and science, lots of university colleagues and collaborations, mm -hmm. lots of government mm -hmm. agencies, both local and federal. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, we're kind of a coming together with information as our currency. Right. And what we try to do is make sure that what we produce is of the highest quality and most authoritative so that when people get it from us or, or know that our stamp is on this thing, they can have a sense that it's been scientifically vetted and it's uh, as good as you can get for information. Right. So probably most folks out there, if they're not avid bird watchers, they heard, for maybe the first time they heard about the Cornell Lab was when the ivory billed woodpecker oh, yeah. news mm -hmm. hit, the, yeah. hit the airwaves and you right. and Tim Gallagher were on yes, national we, TV. Yes, we, uh, we did some time on TV during that era, yeah. Yeah, and I was... I remember, I, I've known Tim for a long time, and when I heard he was one of the people that saw the right. possible yeah. sighting, yeah, one possible of sighting I was like, well, he's not going to be out there pulling any tomfoolery. Yeah, he, he, so he, I was, he didn't make that up. I, I was at a, an ornitho uh, Ohio Ornithological Society meeting. I was mm. at the podium. Somebody handed me a note, and I read it. Everybody started crying. I mean, it was a this emotional yeah, moment for it was a, bird lovers everywhere. That, that Like, yeah. oh, my God, there's... The, like, there's some hope. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, that was a, a, a long arc of hope. And that was a signature few years. Um, and I can tell you that, and of course, we took a lot of flack as well as a lot of excitement. Um, because though it wasn't, you know, talked about this way very much, what we were saying was, if there's one left, then we need to do everything we can right. to find out if there are breeding pairs somewhere. Right. We're not talking about Lazarus back from the dead. We're talking about the world's most endangered bird. Right? Right. So if there is any hope at all, we should be putting all of our effort into finding whether right. there's a breeding pair somewhere. And so that's fundamentally what we did. Right. Um, I remain convinced by the data, but w there are other people who weren't. And so from my standpoint, that's, that's all about data. Yeah. I never felt an obligation to try to convince everybody that we right. were right. Our obligation was to see if we could find a breeding pairs. Right. And uh, so we worked hard on that, spent a lot of resources on it, um, organized some amazing groups for oh, some know, amazing man. months of work in the field in lots of different places around the southeast. And um, haven't turned up a pair yet, uh, mm -hmm. so I have to say it doesn't look very good. I have not given up hope. I'm not prepared to... Uh, call that bird extinct yet. Mm -hmm. We actually got some very interesting recordings from the same region in Arkansas just a f several years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a gentleman working, working down in the Mississippi area who's convinced he's got a spot where there's one or two there. So it's, um, you know, and, and, and the other thing about that whole project, and this continues to the <clears throat> present, which is that it has really focused people on the idea of managing the southeastern forests as if there were ivory bills mm -hmm. still there, which is to say thinking about um, continuous habitat, about yeah. old growth structure. Uh, so it's a lot of conservation has been accomplished since, yeah. the, since those days 10 years ago. And of course, it seems like a, every year there are a few bursts of, we just rediscovered the forest owl. Well, absolutely. We I mean, I just was in Brazil several weeks ago during at the place, at the <laughs> spot where they announced the rediscovery of the blue-eyed uh, ground dove, which right. had not been seen since there were ivory-bill woodpeckers in Louisiana. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there are, um, there are still mysteries to discover out there. And that's so. what makes this whole life interesting anyway. There's yeah, still absolutely. mysteries. We don't know absolutely. it all. We never yeah. will. Right. Mm -hmm. Just a final quick question, because I like to ask my key interviewee victims. Mm -hmm. I, I understand you did a lot of work on Florida scrub jays. Yes, that's been one of my life's research uh, projects. Yeah. yeah. How did you get started in birds, John? What was your I, spark I, bird? I grew up in, in uh, rural Minnesota, and um, my parents had bird books and uh, binoculars. Mm -hmm. My dad was a hunter, uh, so we we had some outdoorsman sort yeah. of uh, approach in our family, and... Uh, I have to say I remember seeing a male American red start when I was homesick in kindergarten. And, uh, and that fact that I could tell what that bird was from a bird book. Yeah. And then I, you know, on that page, the Peterson Field Guide, you know, mm -hmm. with all those other warblers. And yeah. so that fact, I remember even today saying, 
look at all these other things that are out there. <laughs> so then I could see every one of those too yeah. at some point. And uh, so that really kind of got me uh, going. Uh, other thing I'll say, which is an extreme stroke of great fortune in my life, is that I had a neighbor during my entire childhood named Francis Lee Jaques. Oh, one no of the, way. One of the most famous wildlife the artists of the 20th century. Yeah, Museum exactly. Of Natural History. Oh, my goodness. He was my ne- next door neighbor. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, so I got to know him, and I could see him painting on his oh, canvas because sure. he was retired at that time. And, and here's this elderly gentleman, of the just an absolutely wonderful man who was a bird watcher yeah. and loved talking about birds. And so I had a you know, remarkable role model as, yeah. a, as a grown-up. Oh, my goodness. And uh, that made it awfully easy for me to say, this yeah. is a good thing to do. So it, uh, uh, and I started drawing birds. So, mm. so I, I got in real early. Yeah. And so, I, at some point, uh, high school, college, I, I discovered that there were ways to make a living at it. So I said, well, I'm going to give that a try. And so far, it's been working. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> working quite well. It's interesting you say that seeing the picture in the book, I, my spark bird was a snowy owl in Iowa, mm. uh, probably 1967. Mm-hmm. And Thanksgiving weekend, raking leaves, this white bird shows up. That's amazing. And looked in my land, oh, yeah. uh, uh-huh. Chester Reed land Just, bird guy. Right. Uh-huh. Which, and of course, <laughs> Those, snowy owl. And then I flipped a few pages later and I saw a painted bunting and it said, yeah. loves shrubby habitat uh-huh. or, you know, prefers shrub. So I went out in the winter in Iowa looking for looking painted, painted bunting because there were no maps. In the, <laughs> right. But for me, <laughs> the, what tied it in was my dad used to come back from trips and give me those collections of rocks. The yeah, box sure, of yeah, rocks. those box of rocks, yeah. Right. And I loved those, and I'd pull them apart and then try to match them again. And there's mm-hmm. something about collecting the set. No doubt about right? it, yeah, no, no doubt about it. You're seeing, you know, a bird on the page, and you say, look at those other ones. Can I, can I ever fill out that page? So, I, yeah, yeah. So cool. I remember uh, in, in uh, I was about junior high school when I saw the Wilson's Warbler. And I and I uh, that with that word that I'd filled a page and uh, you and, uh, got them all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, well, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule to yeah. talk to no, us great, here. That's great very pleasure. Day. I'm gl- very glad to have you here at the Big lab. Big admirer so. of your vision and all that you've accomplished here with your team, and I'm I'm just it's a pleasure to get to meet you in person again and have a little time yeah, to talk. So thank great. you very well, much. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Mm-hmm. One of my many friends at the lab is Kevin McGowan, an ornithologist and an expert on American crows. Kevin now runs the online education department at the lab. Here's our conversation. Okay, I'm Kevin McGowan. I'm in the education department here at the Cornell Lab, and I'm actually the program manager for distance learning and bird biology. Okay. So I'm in charge of creating new courses, online courses and things like that. We're working on the big revision of the what well, was the home study course, home study course in bird biology for thirty years. Now it's going to be ornithology mm-hmm. because it is. Uh, we have so many different courses right now. It's this one's going to be a little bigger, a little yeah. more rigorous. So we want to met, make sure people know that it's uh, it's it, this isn't just how to identify birds. It's all the biology. It's right. everything. Which is kind of, an, in a way, part of Cornell's mission, right? I mean. Yeah, you bet. I mean, the, we've been straddling the the line between professional ornithologists and interested amateurs for a hundred years now, and that is kind of what we do. Is yeah. we like to uh, we're doing a lot of different things right now, but we've always been interested in taking the science and making it accessible to people and getting people interested in in yeah. the science. Yeah. So. Uh, Who's the target audience of, of the distance learning, like the bird biology course? Would it be, is it anybody who's interested or are you aiming for? Our audience, yeah, is pretty much anybody. I had, I, I do a series of webinars, bird identification webinars, some, a few uh, bird behavior webinars. And I had one very successful webinar class that had a seven-year-old and a 97-year-old in the same class. And they both wrote to say they enjoyed it. So... <laughs> Uh, much spanning yeah it's like anybody I mean we are interested in people that <coughs> that are interested in birds and we hit them at a, at a bunch of different levels we've got a, a, a few <coughs> intro how to bird uh, tutorial type courses that, right. that people can take they're aimed at, at beginners right and then I have uh, well, we just opened up a waterfowl ID course which is a little it starts off you can do it as a beginner but there's a lot more stuff in it right and we're thinking in terms of doing things like I have shorebirds and a raptors 
series of webinars that we're thinking about turning into courses. Those are a little more arcane, you know, right. just a, uh, a lot of people just getting into it have no idea. There's so many different kinds of shorebirds and right. they all look alike. So <laughs> they aren't that interested until they get further into it. But right. we also have a lot of professionals that do this, that, that uh, there are at least six dozen zoos in the country that uh, when they get a new bird keeper, they have them take our home study course oh, in bird nice. biology. So that's, that's just a, a running thing. So, yeah, so people who are doing master naturalist type programs, we've got a lot of stuff for them. Uh, somebody whose kids just left home and is interested in finding something to, to fill up their time, those are our people too. Yeah, neat. Um, Kevin, you kind of made your, I don't know, name for yourself in a way among the bird people, our, our tribe of bird people, as a crow guy a cor corvid guy really yeah. right and can you tell our listeners a little bit about your lifelong fascination with crows or? well crows are crows are cool and they're out there and a lot of people know who they are but hardly anybody has seen enough to know exactly how cool they are right. and what's going on i've been studying the american crow here in ithaca for 28 years this is the 28th year i've climbed up to nest to get kids and ban them uh, and mark them as individuals, so I know them as individuals. We yeah. have birds that, that uh, I, it's not just any old crow, it's a, the, it's mother and father and their two kids and their younger daughter and, right. and that kind of stuff. And so crows I've, are very clannish, aren't they? They have a social system extremely like ours as yeah. Western, uh, Western society, yeah. that they're based on a, a pair, mom and dad, their kids stay with them for a number of years. They also live in a community, uh, the sort of a neighborhood that, that has, uh, they have neighborhood watch, they have interests in common, but they also go out into a bigger community where they, they still cluster in areas like we do uh, when we go further away to the shopping center or right. go you know, walk in the city or whatever. The crows have all that stuff going on, and uh, you don't find that out unless you actually know who they right. are. And we have, we just had our, actually we're a little worried, our oldest bird ever was a female who uh, bred for the 15th time this year, wow. we followed her 15 breeding seasons, and damn merlins came into town, and the merlins don't build their own nests. They, they typically use old crow nests, right. but they actually harass this, this pair until they abandon their first nest this year, and then they build a new nest, and we haven't seen the female since, so we aren't sure exactly what's Shoot. happening, but yeah. They, they so, aren't, you don't have telemetry. No, not on her, and uh, yeah, she's 19. Wow. And so, yeah, it was our, our, by far our oldest bird. That's cool. And you mentioned that the crows here in the parking lot at the lab are... They know me. They know you and you're very, they're very familiar with... Yeah, so th I learned early on that crows think of people as individuals also. It's like we're trying to do with them, they do with us automatically. And it's not just any old person does this. They know that some people are, are more dangerous mm -hmm. than others. And they've learned that some people are more friendly than others. And I got the big dangerous part for the first 10 years. They yelled at me all the time when I was going anywhere. It was like, yeah, you're the guy, you're the one climbing, the, climbing to all the nests. And the they'd chase, they would chase my car down the, the road to yell at me. And uh, you know, you get, because they have a community of, of birds, I'd see these birds on their territories and they would yell at me and I didn't know who they were. I'd never been on their territory before, but they'd come to the group, the neighborhood watch that right. they came over and they knew who I was. And so, you know, you get kind of paranoid walking around and crows yelling at you. So I decided I was gonna do something better and I started giving them peanuts. Yeah. And that worked really well. Crows and humans as, a, as uh, over the last 10 years have really changed their relationships. Yeah. And we've calmed down a lot. We don't shoot them as much, and the crows are responding. And so it's not just me, but they do right. respond to me. And so I toss them peanuts. So they know me. They know my face. They know my car. Uh, they can they can pick my car out of while I'm driving down the highway over here. I, I watched it actually yesterday. I, I saw one of the the local crows sitting on a on the pole as I was driving by. And I looked around. Okay, it's like I'm in a solid stream of cars. There at least. 50 cars straight that are going to go past this point in the the next minute and a half and sure enough the guy comes off the pole and starts to go over to to meet me where i'm going to turn right. and uh, and he's sitting there and follows my car all the way into the parking lot <laughs> did you reward him oh yeah of course you know they have me well trained i feed him but he also seems to know they know me from behind right so they know me when i walk out of the building and walk to my car they know where my car is and they kind of watch my car but they they know me and it's not my face it's not 
not my dress. It's it's not. I don't know what it is. It's my walk. Your aura. Yeah, I don't know. Something That's so funny. Something. So, so what it's do you think cool. the crows call you? Call me? They probably call me Caw. <laughs> or some There's version. Be, so if they've got the name of the of that. They've labeled you as something. Yeah, it was probably the peanut guy. You know, it's. <laughs> It's, it's just, yeah. They could talk to each other. They'd say, "Just go and follow him. Be nice to him. He'll, he'll feed you peanuts. <laughs> he'll give you some peanuts." That's great. Well, uh, we could do we could do a whole episode just on crow stories. I'm sure. Oh my god, uh, it's very dangerous to ask me to talk about crows because I did actually do a two webinar series on crows that are archived that people can actually. Uh, purchase and listen to and they're an hour and a half mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. so that's just right. then we did yeah so it's like don't it unless you got a long long time ahead of you right. don't ask me crow questions where can people find out about the distance learning courses and the bird biology course and all that bird academy uh that's our our evolving education uh site a lot of it's free uh, there's some real cool stuff there, but that's also going to house our courses. If you go to birds.cornell.edu, which is the lab's homepage, and look under education uh, or courses, you can find our offerings. And it used to be we had one course. We are coming up to 10, I think, at the moment. So, And we're working on more. Nice. Kevin, great to see you, man. Nice to see you, too, Bill. And congratulations on all the, the courses rolling out. And Thanks. Being a, a professor to the masses. <laughs> Well, it is true, and it's funny because we had uh, some people that came for like a donors weekend or whatever, and people come through every now and then, and they say, "Oh, I, I you know, I took your course, yeah, and they yeah. know my face, they know my voice." <laughs> it's like I walk out, I'm talking in the in the visitor center, and somebody turns around, "Oh, I know that voice," oh. and it's like, "Well, I don't know who you are because I've never, you know, I don't see anybody." We've had I've had seven thousand students, yeah. something like that, in these courses over the last couple of years, and I when have seen faces on line, like five. They of them. recognize you, and do you give them peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I should. Well, thanks, man. I, I really appreciate you yeah. talking to us. You're welcome. <laughs> Part of my tour of the new lab building involved a visit to the bird range, where more than a century of bird study skins are housed. New curator Vanya Rohrer walked us through the range, stopping first at a table where recently collected and prepared birds were laid out. Here's Vanya. A skeleton, we've got a skin, uh, we've got an extended wing, um, so that's why it also only has one foot because the other foot is with the skeleton. And then, uh, and then we've got tissue samples for doing modern genetic analyses. So these birds were all collected recently? Yeah, yeah, so these are all, um, from a spring trip to Louisiana that, that Brad and myself went on and we took a bunch of undergrads with us. Uh, and it was more of a student training exercise, getting them to the field and kind of introducing them to what field ornithology is like when we're working with them in the museum. Um, and, then, and then some of the others are just miscellaneous salvage birds from, from the West Coast where, uh, where I did my undergrad mm -hmm. out in the University of Washington. So I worked okay. with a museum out there so we've got Partridge out there, yeah, yeah. Are you, can you tell them about your large bird feather? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm I'm pretty obsessed with these spread wings right now, <laughs> and and I'm pretty obsessed with them, um, mostly because of this this variation that we see in in feather age. Mm -hmm. um, so as as birds get bigger and bigger they have just a longer sum length of feather that they have to replace relative to small birds. Um, but the, the rate at which they can grow individual feathers just doesn't compensate for the sum length that they have to replace. So then large birds have this dilemma where they can't replace all their flight feathers in a single year, but small birds can. So because of that, they have to carry feathers for multiple years. And, and the consequence of doing that is you get these feathers that are absolutely destroyed like that. Um, one of the consequences of having these really badly worn feathers is that you create gaps in the wing like that um, and that these feathers probably don't uh, behave or perform as Function, well in yeah. flight Yeah, relative to these new feathers. Um, so one idea is that these, especially in big birds that have feathers of different ages, is that they can preferentially replace overly worn feathers. Um, and I don't think any of these birds have it. Um, so what, what we've been doing now is when we save a wing, 
uh, we've been plucking the underwing coverts mm -hmm. to check out these small little, what we think are sensory feathers that insert right at the base of the flight feathers. Yeah. And, um, and, and so we see a lot of variation in these sensory feathers, and so right now we're just trying to quantify mm -hmm. variation in that to see whether or not it co-varies with bird size and with the mole strategies of these birds, just to try and see whether or not these yeah. birds might be preferentially replacing overly worn feathers. Um, I had a question the other day posed to me, and I realized I didn't know the answer, Maybe, and you probably would. People were debating about a, uh, an eclipse duck. Oh, yeah. And yeah. somebody said, well, uh, ducks go through eclipse plumage. Yeah. You know, and they, it's catastrophic mold. Yeah. They're yeah. flightless for a while. Yeah. Do males and females both yeah. do that? So it's referred to eclipse plumage for both. Even though the yeah. term of it is really about males, males because they're, into, yeah. they're, they're so dull in that time. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we refer to it to both of them, but. It is specific to the males. Yeah, so so there must be a new term there. That could be a pa paper you could write. The new term for females, yeah, right. formerly known as eclipse plumage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a similar <laughs> yeah. brown female plumage. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so yeah, this this will give you a sense of just kind of behind. But well, this is what all the specimens have to go through before they get incorporated into the right. collection. How do they like it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're already past carrying. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Tell me. Yeah, so I'm the curator of the bird mammal collection, and my name is Vanya Rower. Okay. Vanya, um, I was just asking you in there about keeping, adding to the collection of the of the museum, the bird range here, mm -hmm. and you do that through collecting in the field, and it's very controversial. A lot of people don't understand the need for that, but you had a perspective on it that I thought was unique and kind of fit with what would seem to be very, very scientifically based logic for doing it. So can you s tell us why it's important to collect birds in yeah. this modern day? Yeah, sure, sure. I'll <laughs> try and give a succinct answer. That's okay. It doesn't have to be succinct. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so I think the main reason that we should continue collecting is that is that museums are not static entities and that Old collections are wonderful, but they have to be um, they have to be added to with modern specimens mm -hmm. and and that 's because one of the primary functions of museums is to document change over time and so if we stop collecting for a time period we we don 't have any data for that time period we don 't know you know how organisms change mm -hmm. and so that that I think is really one of the greatest values um, for continued collecting. Another reason is that you know we don't really know how species are going to change over time, how the climate is going to change, and just how animals are going to respond. And we also don't know what kinds of technologies we're going to have in the future. Mm -hmm. So continued collecting um, will just serve as, as a record for that time period. And then often as technologies change, we can, we can come back to old specimens using modern technologies to understand the past. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, right now is really easy to overlook because mm -hmm. it's hard to know what technologies we'll have in the future. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that's a, just another reason for continued collecting. Right. Yeah, you mentioned about the isotopes. Yeah. Being able to, when a lot of these specimens were collected, no one knew what a, an isotope was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an excellent example. Just, you know, there's classic work done where they've they've, Used this isotope technologies on specimens that were collected in the early 1900s, and you know, at the time that those specimens were collected, that technology didn't even exist. Right. Um, so that's a classic example. You know, same for genetics, and same for same for all these technologies that we're using on old specimens. the The tricky thing to realize is that a hundred years from now, specimens we collect today are going to be the old specimens. <laughs> right, and very valuable. Yeah. And who yeah. knows what we'll be able to do then? Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, thanks, Vanya. Thanks for the tour. Really great to see yeah, some of yeah. these birds, and uh, good luck with your work. Yeah. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you guys could make it. <laughs> it was Young Birders Weekend at the lab, which was part of my reason for visiting. As the Young Birders filed into the lab lobby for a dinner on Saturday night, I grabbed one of their field leaders, Ian Davies, 
who was not that much older than the participants in the Young Birders Weekend. Uh, my name is Ian Davies. I work here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as the eBird Project Coordinator. Uh, I work with kind of a lot of the program outreach and engagement for eBird. All the stories you see on the front page, I write most of those. And uh, if you send an email into eBird, I'm probably the one that's going to respond. Nice. And uh, how did you uh, get into birds? Yeah. Uh, it was actually, I had the great fortune, I was always into nature in my whole life, and uh, the place that I was living with my family was about a mile from Manomet Bird Observatory oh in Massachusetts. Yeah. I know, it was just meant to be, I guess. <laughs> and so when I was 13 or so, uh, someone down the road was like, oh, you should go check out this bird observatory. I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. I go there and getting to see birds banded at this uh, mist netting operation, and right. someone put a Canada warbler in my hand, and this Canada warbler flew off, and I'm like, yeah, I think I like this. Yeah. Stayed for two hours that day. Came back the next day, four hours, six hours. And that was that. That was it. You were sunk. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. And uh, you were talking earlier about a trip you just returned from. Can you tell our listeners about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really lucky to have just had the good fortune of traveling to China um, last month and kind of May into June and had a uh, really amazing experience observing kind of migration in the East Asian flyway. Uh, one of the target birds, kind of the main impetus for the trip, was spoonbilled sandpiper. And of course, a bird that most people know, just a near mythical, kind of amazing uh, emblem of endangerment of, of species worldwide. Right. About 200 individuals thought to exist in the wild. And uh, we spent three days or so pouring through thousands and thousands of shorebirds, 34 species of shorebirds along this coastal ecosystem near uh, Yangko, China, kind of near Shanghai. And uh, three days of searching, we saw one spoon-billed sandpiper, um, kind of a, a sobering testament to the state of uh, some of the birds in Eastern Asia. And what was the moment like when you actually saw that? I mean, what? Well, first of all, describe what it was like, and then I'm very interested in knowing what was going through your mind as a as a long-time birder and seeking this rare thing on the other side of the planet. The stakes were pretty high. Stakes were pretty high, and I have to admit it was somewhat of a bittersweet moment. Uh, so I was there with two friends, all, all three of us. Were, our main goal was the spoonie. Mm -hmm. And so we're all kind of spread out on the mud flats. The, the situation there, you had about an hour on incoming and outgoing tide, and that was really it for your Because they chances. like the real slurry mud, right? Yeah, and the mud flats are kilometers out at low tide, and then at high tide they go right up to the seawall. And so you just have a short period of time where they're kind of concentrated. Right. So three of us are out there on the flats, maybe 100 feet apart or so, scanning. My two friends, uh, Nick Bonomo and Luke Seitz, have uh, scopes, and they're scanning along the, the flats. And I, I just had bins and a camera. I was scanning flocks moving overhead going up to high tide roosts. And, I mean, scanned through hundreds and hundreds of redneck stints. And then this flock of six birds came by. It was five stints and a spoonie. Just picked out the bill and it was just that that moment where kind of your heart skips a beat when you find something rare yeah. and then I just yelled spoon belt sandpiper voice rose about a thousand octaves and belted it out across the uh, across the mud flats and pointing frantically trying to get Luke and Nick on it about a hundred feet away and so seeing it was the wonderful moment but the bitter part of it was the fact that they didn't get to see it, didn't see it. we traveled all this way and we didn't see another one um, so it was a bit of a bittersweet moment, but an amazing experience with a cool bird. And now we have to go back to China. I right. Guess. They'll never forgive you until you get back there and find it. It's true. You. You're telling me. You're telling me. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for sharing that story with us, Ian. And good luck with everything you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Carl Zeiss Sports Optics supports both eBird and the Young Birders Weekend at the Lab of O. And two Zeiss representatives were there as part of the weekend. Richard Moncrieff, who works for the Carl Zeiss U.S. office, and Petra Schmidt from Zeiss headquarters in Germany. I had a brief chat with both of them on Saturday evening. Okay, uh, we're here in the uh, Fuertes Library with uh, Rich Moncrieff and Petra Schmidt from Zeiss. Petra's here from Wetzlar in Germany. And uh, Petra, you, this is your first birding trip to the U.S., though you've been to the U.S. before, and have you had a good time, enjoyed the birds? I'm having a great time, and it's um, amazing to see what the Cornell Lab um, does for education for young birders, and we're very happy to support that great project. And Rich, you've been involved with the Young Birders Program here for how many years? Three years now, at least, yeah. 
And it's an excellent time, and it's an excellent occasion to see so many dedicated uh, young birders or wither birders or young people who are getting involved with natural study one way or the other to see them come in here and learn about what the lab does, but to see what they've also been doing outside on their own through their own initiative and, and compassion about uh, preservation, conservation, things along those lines. It's always a great time to be with them, and it's always a great time to see you know, what the lab has to offer them and mm-hmm. sort of just suggesting some directions they may go in. Mm-hmm. And Petra, um, you have uh, been with Zeiss for just a little bit of time, but you've, you've, you're with a company that has a, a worldwide reach. Um, what's it mean to you to work for a company that is producing products that people use all over the world? It's uh, great to see um, that we produce products that um, bring people to nature and uh, to have them uh, to have a close focus um, on nature and on birds, on on being in in um, habitat and. Yeah, thinking about what we have to do for conservation cars to preserve um, all that, and um, it's it's really great. Yeah. Okay, so what has been your favorite bird that you've seen in the U.S. so far? <laughs> uh, there are many colorful, um, for us exotic birds uh, <laughs> in Northern America. Um, uh, I really love the um, small hummingbird. Uh, Right. Nothing like that in Germany. No, nothing <laughs> like that in Germany. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for uh, for being part of this and for supporting the young birders. It's something that's near and dear to my heart as well. And it's, uh, keep up the good work with the young birders because that's the future, right? Very good. Absolutely, Bill. And thank you so much. Petra, thank you. Thank you, Bill. The young birders were obviously stoked about the weekend they were enjoying. And I didn't want to slow their roll at all, so I had the briefest of conversations with them. So, if I could ask you, are you having a good time? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Okay, and all at once, tell me what your favorite bird was that you saw. One, two, three, go. Virginia Rail. <laughs> Great, that's all I need. Thank you so much, you guys. One of the leaders of the Young Birders Weekend was Jessie Berry, herself a product of the Young Birder programs and camps from 15 or 20 years ago. I talked with Jessie about what it meant to her to be paying this forward. I'm Jessie Berry from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And Jessie, what's your uh, what's your role here at the lab? So my role at the lab is the Macaulay Library Program Manager and the Merlin Project Leader. Right. And Merlin is a really pretty new thing, isn't it? Yeah, Merlin was just launched a couple years ago, and it's a mobile app to help beginners and other people get identifications of the birds they're seeing nearby. Like the wizard. Exactly. Hey. So um, this weekend you've been here with some special programming at the lab, and uh, uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what that has been? So this weekend we have our annual Young Birders event where we invite 16 students from around the country and beyond to join us to experience you know, what it's like to take your interest in birds and turn that into a career. And they get an opportunity to meet lots of people who have been able to do that and think about how they might be able to take that passion they have for birds and um, think about it as potentially a career. And that's something that's relatively close to home for you, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to these students being 15, 16, thinking, man, how can I have birds be part of my job? And I was really looking to people in the community to figure out what they had done and try to apply that to what my life might shape up to be. So we wanted to create that opportunity for more students. And how's it gone this weekend? Oh, it's incredible. It's just fantastic to see their energy and excitement. And we learned so much about new ideas and new trends. And um, it's been an amazing event. Well, it's especially nice to see such a good ratio between boys and girls here, young men and young women, because... um, you know, when I was a young birder coming up, it was a lot of boys. And, of course, in like in England, for example, it's primarily a male thing. But here in the U.S., it's primarily female, which is not getting the recruitment often in the, young, in the younger generation. Do you think that's been successful here in, in attracting the young birders? Yeah, definitely. I think we're seeing a nice shift in that uh, trend to have a more balance um, between the, the men and women that are starting to come into birding. Uh, at younger ages. And you're certainly a shining example to them of somebody who started off very young and and had some programming that you got to go to. Do you remember any moment when you were a young birder that kind of stands out to you that really flipped the switch for you and launched you into your arc that you're still on? 
Yeah, I think it was uh, the ABA convention in Colorado in 2000, and that was kind of my second time getting a taste of the, inter the national birding community and um, got to meet people like John Dunn and Steve Howell and, and go birding with them and um, really start to see that there was uh, opportunities to take birds um, to become to have birds become part of my, my professional life. So. And you're also lucky in that you found somebody to share your life with who's also a passionate birder, as I did, and that makes it even better, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to have um, Chris Wood as my husband uh, so we can go birding all the time and find fun stuff in the yard or, you know, traveling abroad. i got to get a plug in there for the hubby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesse, it's, uh, it's great to get to see you. I've known you for a lot of years and watched your your uh, growth as a person and as a birder and it's neat to see you as one of the leaders of this young birder outreach and also all the technology that's going with it which is even makes it even more attractive for young people don't you think yeah i think it's uh, nice to see that we can take technology that this generation is very familiar with and start to bring it into birding just a little bit more mm -hmm. and i certainly wouldn't be in this position if i didn't have a number of great mentors and people who supported me so i really just wanted to make sure that we'd have that opportunity for yeah. more students today paying it forward oh yeah absolutely. that's great well jesse thanks so much thanks bill There's a whole lot going on these days at the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, way more than I could cover in this single podcast episode. To learn more about the Cornell Lab, visit birds.cornell.edu. Special thanks to our host, Birdwatcher's Digest, the little bird magazine with a huge amount of great content. Check out BWD at birdwatchersdigest.com and come to one of our amazing events like the American Birding Expo which we're calling the world of birding in one place. We're gonna have more than 100 exhibitors from all over the world. Check it out at birdingexpo.com. Thanks also to Carl Zeiss Sports Optics, not only for sponsoring this birding life, but for all the good things they support around the world. Carl Zeiss, we make it visible. You can join the Zeiss family of birders at facebook.com slash zeissbirding. And Rock Jumper Birding Tours takes thousands of birders all over the world on tours to every imaginable destination. And they'll make your birding travel dreams come true. Learn more at rockjumperbirding.com. And don't forget to check out our cruise to New Zealand's sub-Antarctic islands. We're going to see penguins. If you come along, you'll be part of the podcast that I'll be making during the cruise. Finally, thanks to you for listening. This year we passed the million listener mark. And that completely astounds and humbles me. I'm doing my best to keep the episodes coming. And if you'll keep lending me your ears, I'll really appreciate it. Until next time, this is Bill Thompson III. So I'll see you out there with the birds. Later.